house of the Lord with you tonight, and we are going to be uh, starting a new uh, series of lessons tonight in 1 Timothy, and we're going to uh, do 1 and 2 Timothy, but uh, you know that I won't cover all of those in one lesson. Uh, we will not uh, even get through all of chapter 1 today, we'll get through the first uh, 11 verses or so, I would rather do that and have time for questions and uh, input than to rush along. We are not in a hurry. Uh, at least I'm not. I don't know about you, but I'm not in a hurry. I just like to uh, kind of dig into the Word of God and, and uh, see the richness of it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? And uh, so we'll be in 1 Timothy. And I'll read the first verse, and then we'll just kind of go uh, from there throughout this. If you have questions, comments, obviously, if you know me, just feel free to do that. I'd love to learn from you. Never pretend that I know everything uh, about this because the Word of God is alive. It doesn't change, but our situations and our circumstances change, and it fits into our life and, uh, and, and it speaks to our life no matter what circumstances or situations we're in. All right, welcome to those who are hopefully some are signing on through Facebook Live and later on will join us via uh, YouTube and also on podcast. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. It's just Paul's uh, introduction to this letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. And so right off we see who the author is of this book, and it is Paul. And we see who it is written to, but yet it is, it's, which is Timothy, it is also written to us. Because how many knows that the Word of God is sharp and powerful and it uh, is transcendent in that it speaks to us today as well as it spoke to them back then. And so uh, we see that Paul is the author and he describes himself not just as Paul, this is in your questions, but also he gives us his credentials. And what are his credentials? What, is, who does he, what does he say that he is? He's an apostle first. He's an apostle, right? Uh, so that's that's important. Uh, apostle is merely sent one uh, and a servant. Uh, there are, uh, when you are in the kingdom of God, the higher the rank you would think in the uh, uh, physical, the more, just the more of a servant you are to the people. And so uh, we see that Paul is an apostle and there is an authority behind his apostleship. And what is that? By the commandment of God, right? So it wasn't man's idea that he be an apostle. It wasn't Paul's idea that he uh, become an apostle. But it was by the commandment of God, according uh, to verse 1. Now, anytime the letter, and that's what this is, or an epistle, is more of a formal name for you, is written, there's always a purpose behind the writing of a letter. Even you and I, if we were to write one another a letter, there's typically a purpose or a reason to do that. And so we see that in this letter that uh, Paul has written this letter, I believe, first of all, is to encourage Timothy. It's a personal encouragement to Timothy. Uh, and so that's important. I mean, as we all need encouragement, right? And Timothy was in a, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but Timothy was in a difficult situation here. Uh, Paul uh, had, uh, was going to be leaving. He had been at the church at Ephesus and he was no longer going to be there, so he was leaving Timothy in charge, right? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and 
Ephesus was a very important church, but also Ephesus was uh, a town that was uh, very evil in many ways, and so uh, and there were some problems that he needed to uh, deal with in the, in the church and uh, some opposition. And so we see that he needs some personal encouragement, and I think that's important. How many uh, just ever read the Bible as, as encouragement to yourself? I mean, when it, you know, sometimes it seems uh, to speak to us in that way, and that's important. I think the Psalms are a very good uh, source of encouragement. Now, they're real, too, though, right? I mean, David's like, man, my enemies are coming against me, or whoever the author of uh, that particular psalm might be, but but God, you know, or I called on the Lord and he heard my cry, you know, so there, there's always this source of personal encouragement, and that's what Timothy, uh, that's what this letter was for, but also think about it. Here's Paul, really the founder of this church, and he is not going to be there, which turned out to be for quite an extended time, and he's leaving young Timothy, we know he's young, in charge. And so this letter also is a source or a letter of um, reference for Timothy. I mean, and basically he can say, look, Paul wrote this letter to me, and he's encouraging me, and he's leaving me uh, to do the work of the ministry. And so uh, that's important. Uh, for <laughs> these Ephesian uh, Christians to understand that. Now, look at the time frame of this. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy is a little bit different, but in 1 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, and it's sometime as after his release from the Roman imprisonment that is mentioned in the book of Acts near the end of the book of Acts. And so... So that's kind of the time frame of that, um, and it's written from Macedonia, which we will see uh, uh, is here in this particular chapter, we understand that. So apparently, after Paul had been released and returned to the city of Ephesus, um, he discovered that there were some problems in Ephesus. When I read that, I thought, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? <laughs> uh, so here is Paul, who had been in charge of this church in, in Ephesus, and what has happened is that there have been some false teachers and false doctrine that have come into play, and uh, really Paul had actually kind of some, somewhat predicted this in Acts chapter 20, uh, he talk, uh, talked about that and about how false prophets would arise and, and all those kinds of things. And so um, it is dangerous for a church not to have a strong leader because false doctrine and false teaching can come into play uh, if there is not a strong leader that is there. Uh, not just a strong leader, but a strong leader who understands the word of God and doctrine and the principles of the so, uh, and so Paul is leaving Timothy in charge as his personal representative. That's what's going on here. And he is in hopes that this letter would encourage him but also equip him in that it would be a uh, reference for him uh, to show that he was in, in charge of this particular church at this time. So, uh, and it, it says this, he is, who's the authority come from? It comes from by the commandment of God, our Savior, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, just a historical point of view here, the emperor who we know was Nero at this time, was often referred to as Savior. And so, what's Paul doing here? He's already correcting some false things, right? 
Now, this might not be in the church, but false things that are coming from uh, the environment around him is that Nero really is not the Savior, right? But he is here, uh, Paul is pointing out that it's God that's our Savior. It's Jesus Christ that is our hope. And so that's important for uh, us to, to see and to understand. So he's identifying the real Savior, right? Uh, and it's in the person of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> so let's read verse 2. That was a long introduction. Verse 1, right? Verse 2, let's read uh, that together. To Timothy, a true son in the faith. That's an interesting phrase there, and we're going to talk about that. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, so, who is Timothy? I mean, we know that this letter is to Timothy, but what's his background? Where uh, is he from? And we know from uh, that Timothy came from a city called Lystra, which is in the province of Galatia. And we see that in Acts chapter 16. Uh, he was the son of a Greek father. That's important. So his background was not just Jewish, but it was also Gentile, right? So he had a Greek father uh, and a Jewish mother. His mother's name was Eunice. But he also had a very godly, not only a godly Jewish mother, but a Jewish godly grandmother who taught him the ways of the Lord. Now, that speaks to the importance of what you and I are called to do. We're not just called to take care of ourselves and make sure that we have a right relationship with God, but we're called to raise up uh, young, our young family members, our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren uh, to know the Lord. And we see that this was effective with Timothy, right? Uh, and so it, it's important for us uh, to do that. Now, Paul describes Timothy as a true son in the faith. Now, what might that mean? true son in the faith. Any ideas? What what might that mean? He might say, my own son. My own son. Okay. Paul was like his mentor or his spiritual father. father right. uh, something along those lines. So a true son in the faith. Any other ideas? I think for that time it meant that he was a believer. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. He was definitely a believer uh, as you look at that. And so uh, Paul is calling him this, and it's very possible that Paul led Timothy to the Lord, uh, to Jesus himself. Very possible that even in his first missionary journey, uh, which is described in Acts 14 and Acts 16, that Paul may have led Timothy uh, personally to the Lord. And so that's why he could call him a son of the faith. Uh, and so that, that's important, but also a true son of the faith. And so what is, what is what, what is the word true added to that phrase? He's a son of the faith, in, in the faith, but what, what is Paul saying? He's a true son. What does that mean? Not wishy-washy. Not wishy-washy. Devoted. Devoted. That's good. I like that. Uh, anything else? He's a, a, a true son. He has... Well, yeah, yeah, uh, and we are all true sons. We're sons and daughters of, of the king, but uh, he's speaking to the integrity or the character of Timothy here as well. Uh, and so he's saying he has integrity. He's faithful to the truth, right? And that's important. That's important because Paul is contrasting what's going on in the church in general, but also in Ephesus, is this false teaching, false doctrine, 
and also the falseness of the environment and the city around him and the evilness, he's saying, Timothy is someone that you can trust, right? Remember, this is a letter that is to help Timothy in the role that he is to play of leading this church. And so he is he has integrity and faithfulness to the truth. And Paul is expressing in this, he's expressing his confidence in Timothy. So he's saying, hey, you've got the real deal in this young man of God, right? And he's going to trust him, trust in him. He has integrity, uh, and I've got confidence in him. Uh, and so I'm putting him in charge of this church here in Ephesus. And so uh, that's important. And he he does this and states that grace, mercy, and peace, which is one of Paul's uh, greetings, the way he begins many of his letters. And so how many knows that we need God's grace and mercy and peace, right? Uh, we need all of that. So now, this was a difficult situation. Timothy was young. Many commentaries, and you can kind of see it if you read between the lines in First and Second Timothy, many of them say that Timothy was considering leaving Ephesus, right? That this was going to be such a hard, difficult task, and here Paul was encouraging him to stay on his post, right? Right? Uh, he, he simply says this, I, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, this is verse 3 and 4, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that teach, that they teach no other doctrine. So obviously there was some teaching a foreign doctrine, right? That wasn't what Paul had taught there. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. And so what's, what's Paul saying here? Uh, in your questions there, uh, he's saying, stay in Ephesus. Stay there. Don't leave. It's important that you be there. How many knows that sometimes it's just easy to run away, right? But God had called... Timothy, to be there, right? I mean, it, it's so easy to run away when things get tough and when things get hard and uh, you're young and, and you maybe don't fully understand the charge that is on your life or the calling that is on your life. And so here, Paul is telling Timothy to stay, but not just stay in his location, but to stay with the scriptures. Right? In other words, stay on track. Don't teach things that are outside of the scope of what the Bible is telling you, what the Word of God is telling you, or what I have taught you, what Timothy has, has been taught by Paul. So he's saying, don't just stay there, but stay true uh, and stay true to the scriptures, right? Uh, even, you know, they didn't have uh, these letters in the New Testament era were beginning to circulate, but they didn't have the whole New Testament like we have, right? This was early. And so they had to take the Old Testament, which I mean, knows that you can do that, and you can see what God is doing, and it is a foreshadowing of what God completed in the New Testament. And so you can uh, you can get a gospel picture from the Old Testament as well as from the New. So I'm going to get you to say that again. Say it. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And who was that? That's oh. Charles Missler. Oh, I love Missler. Yes, he's good. Um, so he's to stay, to remain. And Paul is, has left for Macedonia, uh, and, but there's a, a work to do here in uh, Ephesus. And he's 
telling him, stay there, don't give up, don't run away. Um, and, and, and I, I don't want to make this sound like this. I'm not saying poor pastors and ministers, they have to do what they have to do. Because I believe that all of us at times are tempted to not do what God's called us to do. It'd be easy to just walk away, right? That's the easy way out, uh, is to just walk away. But so, uh, but there is a weight, a, a, a pressure, a uh, and even an in internal pressure here that Timothy is dealing with, and the weight of that church is on him, right? Uh, and so that is what pastors deal with, and I'm not trying to. Can, can I tell you, I love pastoring, and I love preaching, and I love doing all that, but there are times that the weight of that becomes pretty heavy, especially if people in your congregation are going through really hard and difficult times, or maybe there's, a, uh, you know, the enemy working in, in the midst there, and so, uh, and so it, it is not an easy task, and we see that's what uh, Timothy is going to be dealing with. So, Timothy might not have wanted to stay in Ephesus. And there's uh, some reasons, and, and there, there's six I listed here, uh, that Timothy might not want to remain in Ephesus. And I think I only asked you to list three of them. So, uh, you don't have to get all of these. But let's talk about them a little bit. Here's Timothy. His mentor, which is Paul, is gone, and it could be that he simply missed Paul and would have wanted to travel with him, right? We know that he uh, is his helper. He's his right-hand person. He's there to help Paul, and so it could be that he might not have wanted to stay in Ephesus because he would have rather traveled with Paul and to be uh, mentored by him, but now you see, there comes a time in all of our lives that we are mentored, but then yet we're, it's time to, to fulfill what God's called us to do as well, right? Uh, and so he might not have uh, wanted to go because Paul wasn't going to be there. Now, there is another thing. He could have been intimidated by Paul's ministry and not really wanted to take on the load at Ephesus, right? Now, think about that. Here is a mighty man of God starting churches, doing missionary trips, doing all these things. He's the founding father of here, the church in Ephesus. That could be intimidating for a young person to walk into and to try to fulfill that role. Uh, can I tell you as a person who grew up in this church uh, and the Lord began to place a call on my life eventually, to pastor this church is like, huh, I can't do that. I know the forefathers of this church, and I, I don't match up. I can't do what they've done. I don't understand the word like they have. I don't have the charisma that they have, or even maybe the anointing that they have. That's just the way sometimes, you know. So uh, there, there may have been a, a level of intimidation. Uh, also, we know about Timothy that he was more reserved in nature, more timid than Paul was. And so, uh, can I tell you, sometimes it's hard for a really reserved person uh, to branch out and to do what God's called them to do, right? I mean, our, our character and natures are different. And sometimes uh, it's, diff it's difficult for us to fulfill what uh, the Lord's called us to do. So, he might have been discouraged already by what was going on in the ministry there. That's one thing. He might have even questioned his own calling. Anybody ever do that? Sometimes I have. Lord, there doesn't seem to be much change. What's, I, what, is this a, is, are, am I really called? Or have, have I lost my calling? Have, you know, uh, so there. He, he might have questioned his own calling 
and then he might have just been frustrated uh, and distracted by the environment around him. So there's all kinds of reasons why he might have wanted to leave Ephesus. Now here's the good news, we know that he did, right? Uh, and that he fulfilled that call. Uh, so there's no doubt that God wanted him to stay in Ephesus. And that his mentor wanted him to stay there. And so uh, Timothy does end up doing that. And he ends up finishing the ministry that God has called him to do. Because Paul knew that Timothy might be tempted to leave throughout this book and even some in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul is encouraging Timothy and giving him reasons why he needs to stay and fulfill the call that he's called to do. And so a, cu a couple of those, and we, I, I could list more, but I'm just going to list a couple of those, the first couple that we see here in these first 11 verses. In verses 3 through 7, Paul's saying, we haven't read all of those yet, but he's saying, Stay there because they need the truth. Right? That's why he calls him a true son of the faith. You need to stay there because it's a possibility they're going to go into error and they're going to follow false doctrine and false teachers. So you need to stay there because they need the truth. That's one of the greatest callings of a pastor or a minister is to preach the truth. Right? And the truth contained in the Word of God. Not just, what does he call them, fables and uh, things like that, but to preach the whole truth. And then, and you see that in verses 3 through 7. Uh, and then in verses 8 through 11, we will see that he needs to stay because he's, this is a hard place to minister in. Now, that also might be a reason to leave, but it's. In other words, you're really needed here. Right? Uh, and, and he needed to understand that. You need to stay because this is difficult. And not everybody is going to be able to do this. Right? Not everybody is going to be able to minister in these, in these situations and this circumstance. And so uh, it's important that Timothy stays there. And there, there are some other reasons uh, that Paul encourages him with, but uh, we're not going to go too much into those tonight. God sometimes, I should say almost all the time, calls us into situations that can be difficult. Right? He needs a man or a woman of God that will stand strong and stand firm and stand upon the word and do what is right. And so uh, we see this and it's a it's a challenge. And so we're to stand up. Uh, and sometimes the challenge is difficult. I want to read this little uh, uh, story that was in one of the commentaries that I read. And this was uh, a famous Arctic, Arctic explorer put this ad in the London newspaper. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. They didn't even say, <laughs> you're going to make a lot of money, right? Uh, you would think that not many would reply to this kind of thing. But there is something inside of us. It's this internal drive that God puts in us to thrive in difficult circumstances. Right? Uh, and God does that. And it says that thousands of men responded to the appeal that they were willing to embrace a difficult job when they were called to do so by a great leader. And so... Uh, Sometimes, it, can I just say this, sometimes the difficulty 
of a circumstance and situation brings out the best in us, right? Uh, and we kind of been, I've been pre I preached about that Sunday. This test that Abraham uh, went through it is the ultimate final test. And God comes back and said, I knew that you were a God that feared me. And he began to show him how he's going to bless him and all these kinds of things. And so uh, we see that. So Timothy's called to charge some not to uh, teach a foreign doctrine, to remain in Ephesus, to not teach any other doctrine. Uh, by the way, doctrine is important to God. It really is. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. And it should not be based upon, well, that's what my mom or daddy always taught me. Or... That's all the stories that I used to hear, and this is what I was told this meant. But we need to dig into the Word of God. That's why this is important, right? And that's why I open up the Bible study for us to talk about it together so that we learn from one another and we understand the doctrines that are involved here because <coughs> we learn from one another, uh, and, and that's important. So doctrine is important uh, to God, uh, even though sometimes it doesn't seem to be important to a, a lot of people. We, uh, we live in a day when everybody seems to question what is true. Isn't that true? Yeah, they're true, right? Uh, a, a relative relative truth that well in this circumstance this is the truth but maybe in this other circumstance you know this is the truth and I'm not saying there aren't special conditions but what I am saying is the truth is the truth right uh, and we're not to have just our own uh, version of the truth but we are uh, to know the truth and it's the doctrines in the Bible that teach us those truths that we need to live by not just truths to understand and to have uh, in, mentally in our mind, but truths that we live by, right? Many people misunderstand what doctrine really is. Yes. They think it's a man-made rule. Right. Instead of scripture. Yes. Yes. Scripture truth. <laughs> and, that, and, and, and the reason why they think it's man-made is because um, uh, there are some denominations that focus real heavy on this one particular doctrine and some that focus real heavy on another and so we see the division and not the unity, right? Some, some create their own. Some do create their own. Uh, and we know that. I mean, we that's if we've ever seen a time when that's happening that's our uh, doctrines that are, uh, I would say man-made doctrines that are totally against what Thus saith the word of God, right? But we're seeing churches right now changing their doctrine. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're 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 totally uh, <coughs> changing and abandoning uh, those tenets of the faith that have been there for centuries. Mainline denominations, not small little uh, individual individual churches. churches, but even mainline denominations that are doing this, and so. Doctrine is important. Um, again, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it based upon the word of God. Not just because your pastor says that's the way it is. I don't have a problem at all with you questioning me. If I teach something and you feel like, mm -hmm, I'm not sure that that's quite right. Okay? I don't, I don't have a problem. Because I found out a long time ago, I don't know it all. I also found out you don't know it all either, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but but that, isn't that the truth, right? Uh, and so we need to be open to learn, not open to go against what the Word says, but open to learn, right? Uh, and to uh, be established in the doctrines of the faith. So he says, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Distractions. Things that will take you off base. I mean, we, as in general, humans are easily distracted. I mean, easily distracted. 
other night I woke up in the middle of the night and I was, it was one of those awakes that I'm not quite awake, but I'm not quite asleep. And I thought, I'll pray for a little while. And I started to pray and I didn't get very far. And I and it just kept like my mind would go to a certain point and it would stop. And I thought, well, I'll rehearse the sermon that I'm preaching on Sunday in my mind. Again, the same thing happened because there's distractions that come into our mind and not only our mind, but in the environment around us. And so here Paul is saying, don't get caught up in the latest and the greatest fables and distractions, right? Uh, but stick to here the word of God. Uh, and so don't get caught in these silly speculations and distractions, um, these endless genealogies uh, could be a, a reference to, like, especially how many of those that the Jewish people are very, very caught up in their genealogy, right? They know it. I'm not saying that's wrong to know it, because there are still those 12 tribes. And when I had uh, dinner with a Jewish man and husband and wife uh, and on a cruise, they both were able to tell me what tribe they were from. Important to them. Important biblically. But you can get caught up in that, those kinds of things, and get distracted to what God is really trying to do and wanting to do in our lives, right? Uh, Yes. You know, there are times when you're not as good. Or right. Or adopted into that. Right. So you kind of get further along. I kind of did that too. Mm -hmm. You're trying to draw you in and say, well, this is the truth. This right. is what I'm supposed to stop. Right. And, and you're not really what you think you are. Right? Because I'm from this tribe and we're special. Right? And this was the call on our lives to be this and to be that. But who knows that God has a call on our lives. Right? Uh, and so uh, these genealogies, it's we don't get a great definition of what they mean, but they definitely are things that uh, Paul is saying is leading them astray, causing them to be distracted. Uh, and the end of that is that it doesn't, it, it causes disputes. It's just a point to argue about, right? How many of you knows that not everything is spelled out in the Word of God? We don't know every detail. And we don't need to get caught up in arguing, well, I believe this and you believe that in some areas. Now, there's some areas that are very important that you understand what you believe, but not these little details that are silly distractions is what Paul is saying, right? And so uh, that, that's important uh, for us. <laughs> and they don't, when you get caught up in those kinds of disputes, they don't strengthen people. They don't lead to edification of the church. They actually lead to division. Right? Uh, and so we have to be careful uh, that we, uh, the phrase, let the main thing be the main thing, is important. Keep the main thing the main thing, right? And so, uh, all right, I think I might have beat that horse to death. So let's move on. Verses 5 through 7. <laughs> now, the purpose of the commandment, talk about the law commandment of the Lord is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from sincere faith from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm so the purpose of the law is not just a list of do's and don'ts Paul saying. There's a purpose for the law and it is love from a pure heart. That's what it's saying. So, how many knows God's all about love? Not just in the New Testament that he's, he's, he's about love, but in the Old Testament as well, right? Uh, and so, uh, now we see both sides of God. We see the justice side of God, but we also see the love side of God. And Paul saying the purpose of the commandments is love. 
to have a good conscience and sincere faith. Uh, it's not about being legalistic. I'm better than you because I didn't walk that far on the Sabbath, but you did. Right? And that's some of the things that the, the Jewish people do, even to this day. It's very much about a, a stringent, legalistic uh, approach to God instead of a, a sincereness and a good conscience before the Lord and about being about love. And so uh, it's not about, it's not just about our outward performance, right? But love from a pure heart. Not, the problem is if we approach God's commandments as just a list of do's and don'ts, then we'll have a tendency to judge very harshly other people. And we don't need to do that, right? We need to love people. I'm not saying accept everything they do. Please hear me. I'm not saying that. But the heart of God is to love people and not to be judgmental in our approach uh, to other people. Let God sort that out. Is that, is that all right for me to say that? Let, let God sort it out, right? Uh, let's just catch fish and let God sort it out kind of uh, mentality. That doesn't mean there isn't true rights and wrongs, but it means that we're not to be judgmental in all that. Uh, and the purpose of the law was so that we would have a good conscience before God. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a good conscience before God? Not feel guilt. Not, not feel guilt, not right? Guilt. Huh? Not feel guilt. To feel not? Yeah. Well, I mean, the fact that you're not. Yes. And so you have a good conscience. You're not stressed out, worried. Did, oh, did I break this? Did I, you know, did I, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I should have done this just, just a little bit better or a little bit but we have a good conscience because we understand that even the law was about a relationship with God. And so uh, not about dotting every I and crossing every T as far as our performance goes. And so uh, it, it's important that we understand that. Even the people, Paul said, it's so bad for teaching such false things and so distracted they don't even understand what they're teaching themselves. That's pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> Can I tell you that I spend hours studying this? Because I need to know what I'm teaching. Right? This doesn't get slapped together uh, 20 minutes before I come up here. Right? And so, uh, here Paul's saying, these people are so distracted, so caught up in these false doctrine, so caught up in the silly distraction, they don't even understand what they're saying themselves. Right? And so that, that, that's pretty uh, interesting there. Uh, vain babbling is what uh, that means. They don't understand what they're saying. Alright, let's read the last four verses and then try to wrap it up here. Uh, so again, Paul Paul's kind of continuing on in this thought about it's a condemnation of legalist uh, uh, mentality or attitude, okay? Uh, but we know that the law is good. The law is good, right? The law is good. That's what he says. If one uses it lawfully. In other words, you can misrepresent and misuse the law. So, it's good if you use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Wait a minute. Let's hear this. Think about it. The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. 
So uh, here we see this big list, and Paul is saying, really, now this is a, a bit of an over-exaggeration because the law is important to us as well, and we need to be keepers of the law, but it's really written for those who are lawbreakers, right? For those who are living contrary to the word of God so that what? So that they understand that there is that there is a I'm looking for a word here that there is a standard that people need to live by right? right. And there's consequences for that. Absolutely. Uh, there is a standard. God uh, does have a standard and he lays this out very succinctly, if you're living in this manner, the law applies to you. Now, he knows that we're not under the law. We're under grace, right? That doesn't mean the law has no meaning whatsoever to us, but that we're living under God's grace, which is, which means that if I break the law, I can come back to the Lord to say, Father, forgive me because I messed up. Maybe it was unintentional. Maybe it was, maybe I knew. Maybe, but now my heart's um, convicted and I want to make a change, right? And so we live under grace, but here we see uh, that Paul is saying uh, the law is really for those who are not righteous. For us who live under grace, the law leads us into righteousness. And what does that mean? Into right types or right kind of living. Right? We know what sin is because the Bible very explicitly tells us what sin looks like. Oh, boy, that's a conversation. So now we have churches that very much contrary say, this is not sin anymore. Right? That's tough. That's not correct teaching. That's uh, unsound doctrine. That's false teaching. I don't know how else to say it, right? Uh, so uh, it, it is here important for us to know God's standard. Now, will we ever, I'm asking this rhetorically, Will we ever fully live up to God's standard? Absolutely not, right? That doesn't mean we go around, because we know that, trying to break all the laws and just trusting in God's grace. It means it's a rumor. It's a standard uh, that we understand that we're to live by and to live righteously before the Lord. So then he, the last, last thing, and then we'll your questions. And then he, so he lists all of these things that, the law, that are contrary to the law and people living in this manner. And then he said, is there, if there's any other thing contrary to sound, sound doctrine, so he's lumping it all into one. Why is he doing this? Because the city of Ephesus is marked, it's a culture uh, that is literally promoting sin and idolatry. So Paul's saying, if I didn't list all of them, know that anything else that you don't see in the scripture, then and it's contrary to God's nature and God's laws, then I'm lumping that in there too, right? Uh, and so uh, it's, it's important for us to, to see. And there's so much false teaching, teaching folks, so much false doctrine uh, going on in Ephesus. Uh, and that is one another reason why Timothy is to remain in Ephesus. Because this is going to be a very difficult task for Timothy. This world that we live in right now is not the easiest place or time frame to live for the Lord, is it? I mean, and I'm not trying to be a downer, I'm just trying to say. Can I tell you that I believe God calls each one of us specifically for this time and this date, for such a time as this? 
And so God looked down through the corridor doors of time, and he said, I've got a work for this people to do, and I'm going to equip them for this time and this day. And so rather than us get discouraged, down and out, woe is me mentality, run and hide mentality, we are to, like Paul is telling Timothy, stand up, right? Stay where God's put you and do what God's called you to do. And so that's kind of these first 11 verses. Now I'm going to do the questions, but if you, uh, just for the sake of time and for uh, the recording, and then we'll come back if you have comments or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm willing to, to stay with that. So question one. In his self-description, which is found in verse 1, what are Paul's credentials? Apostle. He's an apostle. And his authority? The commandment of God. By the commandment of God. All right, question two. two. I'm looking for two reasons here. Why might Paul have written this letter to Timothy? Personal encouragement. Personal encouragement. And then? Personal the a letter of reference or recommendation, however you want to say that, um, to show that Paul literally did call Timothy to do this. All right? Uh, kind of a two-part question here in question three. How does Paul describe Timothy in verse two? A true son in the faith. In the faith right? And for what reasons... Might Paul have given him this title? A couple things we discussed. Maybe. Family heritage. Well, family heritage that, that certainly played into it. Uh, huh? Well, and also because he, he might have personally led Timothy uh, to the Lord. So, all those things, they're not incorrect. I'm, that's just what I was uh, thinking of as I wrote this question. Uh, and then also he uh, was expressing that Timothy was a man of integrity and faithfulness to the church. So, uh, but that true son of the faith, there's no real great definition to what that means. It really spoke to the character of Timothy, uh, his integrity, all of those kinds of things. But could also have spoken of his heritage, which did come from his mother, grandmother, all of that. So, all right, question four. This is uh, according to verses three and four. Uh, Paul urged Timothy to stay, to stay or abide in Ephesus and to stay, stay with the scriptures. All right? Uh, question five. Oh, I did not. Ah, this is one that I failed to, to do. I skipped it in my notes. So I'm going to give you the answer. The word charge is a military word. I think that's important. Because Paul is saying, hey, you've got to, how many knows that we're in a battle, in a fight? Uh, not with each other or with other people, but uh, there's a, with the kingdom of darkness, right? Uh, so a charge is a military word that means to give strict orders from a commanding officer. There's also some more definitions there in the military. Uh huh. One one charge means to go forth immediately right. and rapidly. Uh huh. But so he's saying, hey, don't hold back, right? Don't hold back. Keep go going. Now. But go now. But go now. So there's an urgency to it as well. It's good. I love yeah. this. That's why we open up these questions for people to uh, say this. And he's affirming Timothy's role as the commander of his church. Now, the leader, the, uh, I hate to use the word commander, but it is true because as a church, we're in a battle, and Timothy here at this church is in charge, right? Uh, and he's setting a path. Yeah, there's something else there, too, in the military, uh -huh. though. There's OIC, which is officer in charge, uh -huh. and NCOIC, which is non commissioned officer in charge. And both of those, what they're yes. saying is, that somebody gave them the authority. They're in All charge. Right. They've given, they've, yeah. So Paul's given him the authority to do that, I think. Yeah, yeah. So Paul was 
primarily in charge because he founded the church and he's the but he said, apostle. I'm giving you the authority. Since I'm not there, I'm giving yeah. you the authority. He's, he, he's saying, hey, buddy, you got this. And you, he's the NCOIC? Is that what you said? Well, there's non-commissioned officer in charge. Okay. There's an officer in charge. Okay. You know? So, so yeah, Paul was the officer. Timothy was the non-commissioned officer. Right, right. I love that. Isn't that rich? Isn't that deep? Uh, and that comes from understanding military because you were in, in the military. And uh, that's a great add to, to this discussion. But Liz, also he can take force to end them, doesn't it? I mean, yes. Yeah. It don't mean you wait for the... Can, can I tell you, I believe the modern church is waiting too much. Uh, the scripture that tells us that Jesus said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we look at that verse wrongly sometimes and we think it's the enemy that's charging against the church. That is contrary to the way that scripture is even uh, laid out. It means we are charging the gates of hell. And they're not going to prevent us from making an impact in this world. And that's so rich and so powerful. Uh, so it is, it, it is, as you said, Fiona and Bill, that it's a demand to move forward into um, offense, right? Uh, not just sit back and, uh, for too long, we've sit back and taken whatever the enemy has tried to give to us. Stand. Yeah. Yeah. You've got some offensive weapons in there. You got a sword. You got, you know, all those things that that uh, that were to use that are offensive. So, all right, good, excellent discussion. Love that. List three reasons why Timothy might have wanted to leave Ephesus. Missed his mentor and wanted to travel with him. Missed his mentor, wanted to travel with him. It was too hard. What did anybody else say? Discouraged. Discouraged. Yeah, yeah, intimidated by uh, uh, by following Paul's ministry, maybe even questioning his own calling or or abilities to do it. Uh, so those are things that we we all deal with. Uh, so it's important. Do you want to say something, Linda? He did. Yeah. And if that could be like a father figure to him. Absolutely. He knew that if he did wrong, he'd have him to fall back. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's a big job for a young minister. It is. It's a huge job. That's, that's, uh, and Paul was going to be gone. So. Yeah, and Paul ends up being gone a lot longer than he or Timothy probably anticipated, right? <laughs> yeah. Paul ends up. Second Timothy, we see that he's in prison again, right? Uh, so uh, that's that's important. Two reasons. List two reasons why Timothy should finish the ministry in Ephesus. Because the people there needed the truth. They need the truth, and they needed him. They needed him. It's a hard place to minister. Not everybody's going to be able to do this, but you can. That's what he's saying. Oh, you got your foot in the door. You might as well. Say yeah, it. you're you're there. Yeah. It was. Right, right. Uh, you know, so so many people, when uh, God places a call on our life, they're looking, where do you want me to go, God? And sometimes he's like, no, I equipped you for right here. This is where you're already at. Now get to work, right? Uh, so uh, that, that's important. All right.